I have the honor of sharing this message from the Dave series. And the title of the message is, Failure is Not Final. And so as we've been going through this passage, or these passages of Scripture, looking at the life of David, it's been interesting because really up till now, we've seen David at his best. Uh, really good moments. He's shown great humility when he's anointed to be the king. Uh, he shows great bravery when he goes out against Goliath. He shows great restraint when he's being chased down by Saul. And uh, he also shows a wonderful sense of mercy when he uh, responds to uh, a man named Mephibosheth, who was actually Jonathan's son, Saul's grandson. And John, or excuse me, David had made a promise that he would take care of Saul's offspring, and, and, and David kept his promise. He would bless them. So we've seen him living up to his calling. We have seen him fulfilling and stepping into and fulfilling his destiny. But today it's going to be a little different. And for any of you that know the life of David, you might have an idea where we're going. We're going to see him in one of his greatest failures. Uh, but again, before we finish, we're going to be reminded that failure is not final. So the story begins in the 11th chapter of the book of 2 Samuel. So if you have your Bibles, take it, and we're going to walk through this a little bit. And if you don't have a Bible or you don't own a Bible, uh, you don't own one at home, why don't you take a look at the seat in front of you? There should be a Bible there, uh, and uh, you are welcome to take that home as our gift to you. But we'd like you to follow along with us in your Bibles or your Bible app, whatever you may use. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now, at this point in the story, David's about 50 years old, just about my age. And uh, <laughs> did, I, did, I, did I see something funny? <laughs> uh, oh, I'd love to be 50 again. Anyway, he was, he, he was about 50 years of age, and he had been king for about 20 years at this point. So some time has passed. Uh, and uh, he has now established in his reign and in his sovereignty. We begin in this 11th chapter of 2 Samuel, verse 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent out Joab, that would be his commander, with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites, so they had some victory, and now they are besieging a city named Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. That last part of this text, of this sentence, is so critically important because it just seems out of place. It's spring. It's the time when the, 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 the weather of the winter has passed, the coldness and whatever it may have been, and now it's time when the armies rejoin their battles to claim their territories and to claim their authority. And so the Bible says the kings go off to war, but, but, but David didn't. And all the other kings lead their armies, but, but David didn't. And the other leaders did what they were supposed to do, David didn't. And we find David staying in Jerusalem and relaxing perhaps when he should have been fighting. And what we're about to read next is what can happen, what can happen when you're not in the place that you should be. You see, when you're not in the place where you should be, you're in a place perhaps where you shouldn't be. Not only in a time, but even at a place, but also a time when you shouldn't be there. And when you fail to recognize that the, the battles of your life that happens when you're where you shouldn't be and you're not doing what you should be doing and you, you don't recognize the biggest battles you're gonna face in life are the battles of your heart. What can happen when you're in the wrong place? You're, you're in, unable to withstand the temptations of sin. And hear this, you don't discipline your senses and don't control your thoughts and sometimes you drop your guard. That's exactly what we're about to read about in the next couple of verses. Continue reading. One evening, verse 2 and 3, verse David, uh, one evening David got up from his bed and walked around and on the roof of the palace... From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone out to find out about her. The man said, <coughs> She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam. You, you know Eliam. And, and the wife of Uriah, he's one of your men that's out fighting for you. 
He's one of the Hittites. So let's pause here before we move on with the story. We need to recognize that David knows exactly what he's doing. David knew about Bathsheba, and he knew who she was. He probably even knew her family. David knew she was a married woman, and he should have got off that rooftop in a moment. But keep reading, verse 4. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and slept with her. He slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, I'm pregnant. Uh, a very bad situation has just turned disastrous. What does David do? He, he panics. You see, when we sin, as we've been reminded, most of us need to know, we all should know, that we really have two options. When we sin, we can, we can fess up or cover up, basically. Well, David goes for the cover-up option. He tries his best to conceal the truth. He, he sends word to, uh, to get the husband, get Uriah back home. And Uriah gets there, and he says, David, David says, you, you got a couple days rest, son. You just go, go home and spend your time with your wife. Uriah says, okay, heads towards home, and he says, wait a minute. My friends, my colleagues are in war and in battle. I'm not going into that house. I wouldn't do that. I disrespect my guys. I'm staying right here. Oh, that plan didn't work. David calls him over the very next day, and he says, uh, uh, Uriah, um, why, why don't you come on over to the palace, and we'll have a nice time together. Let's spend the evening at the palace. They haven't invented movies yet, so we'll just spend some time talking together. And, uh, and by the way, would you like some wine? And maybe here's a little bit more. And are you getting tired, Uriah? Why don't you go on back home and just spend the night with your sweetheart? So Uriah leaves, but he doesn't go home. He can't. He's thinking about those guys again. Now David's got real trouble. So the next day he calls him back and he says, Uriah, uh, I, 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 have, I have something, it's a something you need to do. Uh, I'm going to ask you to go back to the battlefield. But what David had done, and Uriah didn't know, David had sat down and penned a letter to Joab. And the letter says, send this man Uriah against the battlements of Rabbah. Send him into the very worst of the places. And when he's there, Back off a little bit. Make him a hero. Uh, and uh, when the rest of the guys back off, uh, Uriah will no longer be a problem. My enemies will take care of him. Can you imagine? He takes that letter and puts it in Uriah's hand. He says, Uriah, go ahead back to the front. And by the way, give this to Joab. The, the tragic irony is Uriah is carrying the letter with his own death warrant in it. He takes it back gives it to Joab. Joab reads it and does what he's told to do. And Uriah is sent to the front of the battle and inevitably he is killed by his enemies. The news comes back to David and I suppose David thinks he's got everything taken care of. Everything's going to be all right now. Uriah is dealt with. And uh, it's all going to be okay. Seemed like his plan was working. Let's jump to the 26th verse, if you will do that. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore his son. But if he could just get her moved in quickly, maybe the rumors won't even get started. And at this point, it looks like David's plan has worked. They all lived happily ever after, right? No, 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 no. Go to the 27th verse, or the 28th verse. But the thing, is that the one? What's the verse? It is, the latter part of the 27th verse, I'm sorry. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. That's polite. 
The literal translation of that text is, what David did was evil in the sight of the Lord. David thought he'd got away with it. He thought nobody knew what happened, but God knew. David thought nobody saw what happened, but God saw. And what David did to both Bathsheba and to Uriah was nothing less than evil. But if you, if you think about this for a moment, how in the world could this happen? We're talking about David here, church. We're, we're, we're talking about Dave. We're talking about David. This, this is the David who was called the man who was heart was after God's heart. This is the David that the nation had hoped for and longed for, anticipated for some time to be their king. This is the David who was the giant slayer. This is the David who had many opportunities to protect himself when he was being hunted by Saul, but he refused to take the situation into his own hands. This is the David who demonstrated integrity and faithfulness in all of his dealings, it seemed. And, and this is a David who won the trust of the entire nation. This is the David who was the author of so many of the beautiful psalms that are still in your Bible today. Some of them beautiful psalms of worship. This David, and here he is. He has intentionally committed adultery. He's guilty of premeditated murder and its cover-up. He is the face of pure evil. So how does a man go from being a man after God's own heart to a man that's enslaved to his flesh and becomes the face of evil in his nation? Let me offer three, th three things. Number one, I'm sort of touched on this already. David is resting when he should have been fighting. David's resting when he should have been fighting. Nothing wrong with rest. But when it's in place of a time and a place that you should be, it's dangerous. You see, when war was called for, he was disengaged from the battle. Remember that first verse we read? In the springtime when they go out to war, this king decided to stay home. He disengaged from the place he needed to be. This David, the mighty warrior who rushed out in battle against Goliath, is not even with his own men that day. Instead, he's at home when he should have engaged in the battle. And this arrangement, this arrangement sets, up, sets him up for his shocking failure. Hear me carefully. When you are disengaged, from the battle God has for you. That is when you're most susceptible to the temptations of the flesh. Can I say it again? When you're disengaged from the battle God has for you, that's when you're most susceptible to the temptations of the flesh. Temptations of the flesh, oh my goodness. We are surrounded by it. Our North American world right now is most certainly hypersexualized. From the social media feeds to the cable television networks and, and TV networks that we watch and the music we hear, just about every form of entertainment and even the commercials that sponsor it are things to which we are exposed with the proof of the old adage in Hollywood and on the stage and in commercials, sex sells. It's always been that way, but never more than it is today. We are inundated, 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 inundated. Thank you. We are <laughs> swamped. <laughs> We are inundated with sexual temptation almost everywhere and almost all the time. And that goes for both men and women. We've been reminded, reminded recently that there's really two kinds of sin. Sins of commission, that means doing things you're not supposed to do. And sins of omission, that means not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, those who analyze these things suggest that 
sexual sin often starts with the sin of omission and then leads to commission. In other words, you're not doing what you should be doing and it leads to you doing what you shouldn't be doing. See, when you're disengaged from what you're, you should be doing, what are we talking about? What are the things that we should be doing? Well, first of all, giving daily time to spending time with Jesus. If you're close to Jesus, it puts you in a place where you're not so easily engaged with the enemy's temptation. Not loving your wife with the kind of love that Jesus ha has for the church or, or perhaps not loving your spouse with the respect and honor that he deserves. These are things we should be doing. Not respecting your body as the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says your body is the Holy Spirit's temple and his dwelling place. Not keeping up reading and, and having the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against God as David would later say. Not actively resisting the devil's voice and resisting him. And the Bible says he will flee from you. Not remembering that you are the, temp, the target of the enemy's weapons of destruction and you need to keep armed with the whole armor of God. Those are the things that we must do. And when we don't do what we should do, we end ourselves doing what we shouldn't do. Uh, listen to this carefully. When we disengage from our roles, when we disengage from our roles as leaders, as defenders of righteousness and purity in our families, in our communities, and in whatever sphere God places us, we become easily captured by the allure of temptation of the sinful nature that crouches at the door of every human heart. Pooh, can I say it one more time? When, I'm going to do it anyway. When we disengage from our roles, when we disengage from our roles as leaders and defenders of righteousness and purity in our families, in our communities, and in whatever sphere God has placed us, we become easily captured by the allure of every temptation, the sinful nature of the sinful nature that crouches at the door of every one of our hearts. So what happened? Well, first of all, David rested when he should have been fighting. Number two, David put himself in a place where he could be tempted. What's he doing? He's out walking on the top of his palace at night. Now, I'm sure he had a right, but it probably was not the right thing to be doing. I somehow believe this is not the first time he'd done this, and he had an idea what he might be able to see. It was the Old Testament equivalent of browsing the internet alone late at night. Out on that rooftop, David points, clicks, clicks again, dwells on what he sees, and then his feelings and his desires begin to overwhelm and overpower him. So how does, quote, walking on the roof time at night in the darkness happen to us? Well... Maybe it's scrolling social websites and responding to the person that invited your response. Or maybe it's pointing and clicking at things you have no business looking at. Maybe it's engaging in extensive private conversations, text conversations, or maybe it's going for drinks with a person after work, or, or maybe it's meeting together with somebody after work or even on a business trip. Hmm. Walking on the roof type. What rooftop at night in the darkness. So what's the lesson here? Here's the lesson. Very profound. Stop walking on rooftops. <laughs> Come on, that was better than me trying to stay inundated. <laughs> be where you should be and be doing what you should be doing. Perhaps that does mean making yourself more accountable for your time. Perhaps it means uh, getting some accountability around your internet use. By the way, Covenant Eyes is an excellent uh, piece of software that you can access. It may mean rethinking your relationship with people and determining who's influencing who in this relationship. So let's recap. How did David end up in this situation? He's, he's resting when he should have been fighting. He's put himself in a place where he can be tempted. Number three, David has concealed what he should have confessed. 
Three times David goes out of his way to cover up what he did. Brings Uriah home. Spend some time with Uriah. Uriah didn't happen. Come on over to my place and let's just have a fun evening together. And then you just go back and spend the night with your wife. Didn't happen. All right. Go back to battle. Be a hero. I'll make sure it happens. You know, it's easy to beat up David. He deserves a few swats. It's easy to beat up David. But if we're honest, most times we do the exact same thing. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute, Pastor. No, what I'm talking about when I say the same thing, when I say we do the same thing, I'm talking about the fact that we conceal rather than confess. Why? Why don't we deal with sin? Why, why do we all just try to cover things up? Think about it. Oh, and you say, well, oh, pastor, if I really come clean, if I let people know what I've done and who I am, and, and they'll realize that I'm not all that in a bag of chips after all. Okay. But let me ask it. Ask you, is it really easy or do you find it exhausting just trying to cover up everything? What about trying to keep all those lies in order and make sure you remember each one you told and how you told it and the details? Isn't it lonely feeling like you've never been fully known? When you finally slow down enough to lick and look, look at what's on the inside, does it haunt you? Realizing you're not free. You think free, you act free, you sound free, but in reality, you're not. But the truth is, Christ came to set us free. That's why he came. I was reminded again yesterday of this wonderful scripture that the Apostle John gives us in his little epistle, the first chapter in the ninth verse. If we confess our sin... He is faithful and he's just to forgive us all our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's a whole lot better. What a wonderful promise. As hard as it is dealing with truth, it's much harder when you try to live with the lie. Worship team, will you come on back up with me and Help me as I finish this message this morning. And so, we've looked at the tragedy of David, perhaps his greatest tragedy. It happens because he's resting when he should have been fighting, and he puts himself in a place where he could be tempted, and he's concealed, he concealed things that he should have confessed. Now, now, now listen. I am not trying to bring shame or despair to anybody in this room that's ever allowed themselves to be involved in sexual sin. But I want to be clear, whatever sin it is, there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. You see, we won't take time today to tell this whole story, but just to let you know that it wasn't long after what we've talked about this morning that God sent the prophet Nathan to David. And Nathan would expose David's sin to David's face and David had to make another decision. And that decision is, am I going to run from God or am I going to run to God? Well. And he determines, I'm going to run to God. And there he confesses his sin and the scripture tells us in the 13th verse of chapter 12, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord, the Lord has taken away your sin. Think about it. The joy of knowing you're forgiven, the knowing you're clean, knowing that when you look inside, you see a cleansed vessel. How much marvelous that must have been for David. Sometime read the 51st Psalm as David pours out his confessions before the Lord. And he longs for that place of being close to the Lord Jesus and experiencing an awareness that he is forgiven, and he was. But let me tell you this. David 
was not only forgiven, but God chose to create beauty out of the ashes that were left behind him. Hundreds of years later, hundreds of years later, after all of David and Bathsheba's stuff is done, Jesus is about to choose a name by which he will be identified, a title. And he says, I will be called the Son of David. Wow. Restoration or what? In fact, have you ever noticed in the Bible that you're holding, have you ever noticed? that no one went through there and ripped out all the psalms that David wrote. No, here we are another 2,000 years later, and we're still able to read the wonderful words of the psalmist. God is a God of restoration, and failure is not final. I looked last evening and I found a wonderful scripture in the prophecy of Micah. I'll put it on the screen for it, for us to look at. The prophet looks at his enemies around him and he says, Don't gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Because I've sinned against him, I I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and upholds my cause. He will bring me out into the light and I will see his righteousness. What a glorious statement. What a powerful statement. Failure is not final. Failure is not final. Being a godly man or woman is not determined how many times you fall. It's determined by how many times you get back up again. Every one of us of years has made a mistake, but we need to stand and declare, I may have made a mistake, but I am not a mistake. Don't define me by what I've done. Don't define me by the worst places I've been. I may have failed, but I am not a failure. We looked at David's greatest failure, and I hear these words to say to you today that the greatness of the measure of David's failure is surpassed only by the exceeding greater measure of God's grace. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. His grace is greater than our failure. No matter how big the failure is, his grace is bigger and greater still. Failure is never meant to be your final word. Failure is never meant to define or destroy you. Failure is never meant to be the story of your life, your epitaph, or your legacy. In fact, no matter who you are or where you've been, when it comes to your life story, it begins when you're born again. It begins at the cross. It begins at the place where you come to the cross and say, Jesus, I need you today. I need your cleansing. I need your blood to wash me and make me clean. That's the beginning of your story. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.